printed it out and brought it. What happened is while I was studying and putting my notes down, that little section in the, in the middle there where it starts, where it says, uh, fortunately, prayer is not primarily for the purpose of getting, but for the purpose of giving and motivating the doing. Uh, that is, that is that's plagiarized a little bit. I used to carry around a little thing about prayer in my Bible. It started that way and it ended that way. Not, it didn't even start the full way I wrote it. But through the years, I've added to that, and, and I wanted to have that clearly typed out in case I wanted to read it to you in my notes. And then when I did that, I thought, well, why don't you just go ahead and put a couple other things down. And so what I'm saying, the reason I'm saying that is the, some of the places where you'll notice, obviously, I'm quoting the Bible. I'm not, I didn't put quotes around it, and sometimes it not, might not be exactly word for word because I was just typing and putting the thoughts down, and then at the last minute decided to uh, make a a copy available to you for your further study, uh, maybe uh, anyhow for your scrutiny and all the rest. Um, I I, will, I don't know if the devil didn't want you to uh, didn't want you to have it or God didn't want you to have it. But when we <laughs> just we we're getting ready to leave, I run down the copy machine, I start printing, and the copy machine runs out of toner, and there's no more toner. Okay, I run up, get the computer going, start printing them up, the rest of them on the on the computer, and the printer runs out of ink. I looked for the spare ink, no spare ink. I gave up. What I had printed, I brought. <laughs> so I don't know if you, everybody got a copy or not. And for those on the, uh, that are with us by the streaming video, if you email me at tombruchet at forgottentruths.com. Oh, that's right. T. Bruchet at forgottentruths.com. Uh, Sanja will make sure that you get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there is some back there, and so if anybody wants. Like I say, it's, you, you don't need it to follow around the notes because that's not really what I'm preaching. I might say some things there. Certainly the purpose of prayer and the privilege of prayer is, is something I want you to get the thought of because prayer is probably something different than what you think it is. Uh, before we, uh, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 6. So if you'll turn there in your Bible before you go there, when I talked about everybody getting upset about prayer, I think I've heard this read even maybe at one of these conferences, uh, but our person who does the bulletins put a proper statement in the bulletin there that I wanted to read to you. It's called uh, The Proper Way to Pray. The Proper Way, the proper way to Pray, said uh, Deacon Lamuel Keyes, is not only, uh, is, is, uh, and not the only proper attitude is down on your knees. So I should say, uh, no, I should say, uh, the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms and wrapped and uplifted eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Samuel Slow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes closed and head bowed. Seems to me his hands should be austerely uh, collapsed in front with both thumbs pointing uh, toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Blunt. Uh, a few years ago, I fell in Hitchens uh, well, uh, head first, said Cyrus Brown. Both my, heels, uh, both my heels were sticking up and my head was pointing down. And I made a prayer right then and there, the best prayer I ever said, the prayerest prayer I ever prayed was standing on my head. <laughs> Kinda. Matthew chapter 6, and uh, begin with me in, in verse 8. It says, be ye not therefore like unto them. The Lord Jesus Christ talking here, teaching uh, about not being like the hypocrites who pray, you know, out in public to be heard of men. He instructed to be pray in their closet. And then in verse 7, he instructed them uh, not to pray like the heathen do through vain repetition, thinking they're going to be heard. He said, be not therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do pray that we can learn some things about prayer and that this
time of, of study and, and talking about this blessed privilege that we do have to pray uh, would be an encouragement to us to make sure that we're taking advantage of it and that we are communing with you in prayer in everyday life and particularly in, in regards to how you're dealing with us in this dispensation of grace. So, Father, we do pray this will be a profitable time. We pray it will be uh, meet a need in each person's life. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Strange to go to a grace conference and start out by reading the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> but what most of us realize that if you want to read the Lord's Prayer, you go to John chapter 17. This is certainly the disciples' prayer. And this is the prayer of Jesus Christ teaching uh, the apostles, but all the nation of Israel concerning his, his program with them. It's not so much that uh, I want to look at the Lord's Prayer and, and, and study what he's saying there, although it's going to be beneficial to know what he's saying and why he's saying it. But, you know, one time when I started teaching on prayer, I, went, I looked at this and realized there are five principles of prayer that are here that's true of all of, of, of prayer in any dispensation. Five principles of prayer that you should know about, and, uh, and I, I, we, I'll glean them from here, and at the same time, talk about some things about what this prayer is, and why it is that that isn't something we should be praying in this dispensation, and when you see that, you'll begin to realize, yeah, that isn't something we should be praying about, then what it is it should we be praying about, and, and the, the subject matter will proceed. As well, I want to spend some time, even as we begin, to, to talk about that idea does God really care? Because some people think that if you, you can't pray about certain things, especially if you can't pray about healing or something like that, or shouldn't pray about healing, then, uh, then God doesn't care. And we need to actually deal with those thoughts about that. But here, when the, when the Lord Jesus Christ begins to talk to them about prayer, and he, he told them don't pray like the hypocrites or like the heathen, he said in verse 8 again, Be not therefore like unto them, for your, your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. That's interesting. Apparently, prayer is not getting things out of God. And even in, in any dispensation, nobody in the Bible ever thought God was a genie in the air, that all you had to do was ask him, and he's going to give you everything you want. That idea actually comes out of, I don't know how far it goes back in time, but that actually comes out of the idea of when later on the, the Lord Jesus Christ trained 12 apostles to carry on his ministry in his absence. And in their apostolic authority... And with the coming of the Holy Spirit that was going to be given to them, the Holy Spirit was going to supernaturally empower them and cause them to walk in His ways and keep His commandments. You know in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit came, He did indeed fill those uh, in the upper room. And that filling is complete control. And in light of that complete control, God gave them the responsibility in His absence that anything they asked, they would receive. And in the ignorance of men, not knowing who that promise was to and what it was about, people begin to think that God's a genie in the air, and all we do, what prayer is all about, is asking God to fulfill all your wants. And that's never been what, never has been what prayer was. I mean, you can see that from that verse there. The Lord knows what you need before you even ask Him. That, that's never been the purpose of prayer. When he says in verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When he talks about there, that's an amazing statement. Our Father which art in heaven. Now that's the nation of Israel acknowledging the God of heaven is their father. And they were the only people that had the privilege to ever call God, acknowledge him as father. Us Gentiles didn't have that privilege. And yet, in the same sense, you never see in the Old Testament Israel ever calling God father. They would know him as father, but they would address him as Lord. There's a reverence, and that reverence certainly is there, hallowed be his name. But that is a special privilege and a relationship that God had with the nation of Israel, especially in light of the new covenant to them where they were going to receive the spirit of adoption. One that you'll realize in this age of grace God has given to us who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But they have that privilege of addressing him as our father. And to be able to talk to God as our Father, that's why in that paper that I gave you, the first two things that are in that paper are important for you to stop and think about. That the purpose of prayer is to bring God and His Word into every situation, communing with the Heavenly Father, receiving peace and awareness, and you'll see the receiving of those things, but while acknowledging our, our weaknesses, our dependency upon Him, 
reminding ourselves to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Uh, the prayer there is, 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 is just bringing God into the situation. If you know the Lord is your Savior, and, and if you are, you're in Christ, God's Spirit is in you, God is in every situation. But you don't bring God into every situation. Prayer is a reminder to you to bring God into that situation that you face in life. And that is one of the, that, that's one of the purposes of prayer. The privilege of that is communing. Instant, instant access, continual instant access, communing with our Heavenly Father, uh, of whom are all things and to whom are all things, who, hath, uh, who, who has revealed to us His purpose and grace, and some of this is getting ahead of what I'm going to teach you, but His will for us, to whom we serve, who has given to us His Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so you immediately even see that the first thing about prayer and some of the principles of prayer prayer is a personal fellowship with god our father it's a privilege that we have the the second part the the second principle of prayer verse 10 there he says thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven so that you begin to see just this the principle first is that prayer always concerns god's will prayer isn't about your will it's not you telling God what you want. It's you acknowledging what God's will is. And here, it's, it's in the nation of Israel. It's in their program. That brings us to the third. Let me read another verse here. Give us this day our daily bread. So, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, this brings us to the third principle about prayer, that prayer must be dispensationally considered and, uh, and, and aligned. That, that here when you realize what you're reading about, about the nation of Israel, is God's purpose for the nation of Israel is to bring a kingdom here on earth. And they're praying about that kingdom from heaven to come and to be established on the earth. And that's what God's purpose for the nation of Israel is. So that they're praying the program that God has for them. And, and that includes that before that kingdom comes, they're going to go through a time of tribulation and God's going to have to feed them those last three and a half years before that kingdom comes. That's why when you get down further, he's going to talk about deliverance from evil. But the point is, is you see what this prayer is about. Who, who can pray this prayer because it pertains to the doctrine and the dispensation of the kingdom that's going to be established on earth with the nation of Israel. That kingdom come. If you know anything about the dispensation of grace, we're not waiting for a kingdom to come. We're waiting to be raptured out and go. So we wouldn't be praying this prayer. This, this, is, this is not ours. But the principle there, God's will be done. That's what the principle of prayer is, to pray about God's will when you pray. But we wouldn't pray for that kingdom to come. When it says daily bread... You don't pray for your daily bread. The Bible tells you in 1 Thessalonians, and Paul has to repeat it in 2 Thessalonians, that in order to make sure you don't have need, that a person needs to go work with his hands. And then he tells you in 2 Thessalonians, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And that's a warning to the saints there, that if a man's not working, don't be feeding him. Certainly, when, when a man comes to our assembly looking for some Food is usually what they say, and, and wh whether it's that or not, you don't know what all the situation is. But if it's a man that I decide I think we should help him out, there's always windows to wash. There, there's always things to do around them, and, and they have to do it before we ever shell out any money to help them because if he doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. But anyhow, you don't just pray, God, give us our daily bread. You go to work and earn the money. By the way, that doesn't mean you don't pray before you eat. You know, every time I read in Scripture about anyone eating, they're always praying and giving thanks before they do. And you say, well, you know, the, the, well, the idea of that is everything that we have comes from God. And you say, well, I go to work and get it. Well, how did you have enough energy to go to work? Well, you ate food before you went there. Now, the food that you ate, did you cause that to grow out of the ground or does God bring the increase? Ultimately, ultimately it comes from God. And to, and to thank him for it isn't, isn't saying that you don't go and work for it. Thanking him for it is acknowledging the goodness of God, as it says there in, that, in Acts 14, that he gave us uh, rain from heaven and, and filling our hearts with food and gladness. God did that. 
And out of gratitude, you thank the Lord for the things that you do have and the provisions that you have. But, but the point is here, when he says daily bread, that, that is certainly something dispensationally. Look at, look at the next thing in verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. When he says, when that prayer there about forgiveness, these are some of the things that we help people, and I don't know where you're at. That's why I said when I started in your own Bible study, if you even understand what dispensational truth is. But the message in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and God's purpose for the nation of Israel is to establish the reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. Initially be a thousand years, ultimately be eternal. But that's God. When God created the nation of Israel, that was the purpose that He created them, singled them out, and was using them. And that's where Jesus Christ came to them to fulfill those promises that were made to them. And and, and in that process of doing that, God was dealing with them a certain way under the law. And and when you start reading this, and, and then start reading Paul's epistles, you understand God's doing something different. One of the other things that's different is these people were to forgive others in order to get forgiven. That's how God was dealing with them under the law. And they're praying the doctrine that God gave them under the law. When you understand the gospel of the grace of God, that we don't deserve salvation, salvation's freely given to us of God through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And the Apostle Paul tells us that after you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He goes on to tell us that we are to... uh, to to, uh, forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. In fact, in Romans, uh, in Ephesians 1, 7, he says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians says, we've been forgiven all trespasses. We don't ask, or we don't forgive someone to get forgiveness. In Paul's epistles, we understand by the grace of God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and are trusting that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the payment of our sins, that we are forgiven, and because we are forgiven, we forgive someone else. That's different than what they're praying about. So we wouldn't pray this prayer either. But there's something I want you to think about. Why would they pray something that God's going to do anyhow? Do they have to say, do they have to say to God, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors? Because God already said, if you forgive your debtors, I'm going to forgive you. That's not there to get God to do something. That's there to give them an awareness of, the, of how God is dealing with them. It's prayer there is, is they're praying the prayer that God said to the, them, the doctrine that God gave to them to, for their own awareness. And with that awareness, that verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That they're going to go through an hour of trial and they're looking to God to deliver them from evil. And they're they're already acknowledging those things are going to come and looking for God's deliverance in that time to come. So they're praying. They understand what, what they're going through, how God is dealing with them, what they're facing. And they're praying that doctrine not not to get something from God, but for their own personal awareness and and reminding themselves of their dependency upon God to make it through that time. So I don't know if I numbered those things. The third thing, the third principle of prayer was it must be dispensationally considered and aligned. And then number four is prayer is a faith. And faith, by the way, prayer is not you, you believing your prayer. The prayer, praying in faith is believing what God said to you. And, uh, and so praying in faith is praying what, the, what God has said to you and and with that understanding of God's purpose for you. And then the fifth part uh, principle of prayer is praying. Prayer is for our good, for our awareness, for our inner strength. Now that, that's true of all prayer. Now before we get to some of the verses. And, and by the way, Paul speaks about prayer some 32 times. Interestingly, he doesn't speak about prayer in the book of Galatians or in the book of Titus. And, and yet there's principles in the book of Galatians that would certainly help you uh, understand prayer. We'll talk about that. But the, the subject matter is prayer, does God really care? Well, you're starting to realize that there's a difference of praying, not Israel's program, and certainly not praying the Lord's prayer because it has nothing to do with God's doing with you. If you believe in the body, the church, the body of Christ is going to be raptured, that you're going to be going and he's not, you're not waiting for him to come and you're going to be raptured before that wrath comes 
then you're not praying for that deliverance through that time of trial. It, none of this would have anything to do with you, so it wouldn't be something you should be praying about. And you realize then, boy, that prayer is different, and, uh, and I must be adjusting the things that I pray about. But in the confusion of that, people say, would, would get upset and say, well, then God doesn't care. And so when we talk about prayer, does God really care? I, I started thinking quite a bit about that idea, about people saying, asking, even asking the question, does God really care? And I realized that prayer can ask, be asked two ways. Get Romans chapter 8 first. That question, does God really care? That, to give someone the, the, the credit for um, saying that in a, in a mature way, in, in a way of faith, maybe, maybe not understanding everything, but what I mean by that, in a way of sincerity. Uh, when they ask that, they're asking that out of discouragement. Something has happened in their life, and they're, they're, they're in some type of despair. And they're wondering, you know, does God really care? They're praying about a situation. They don't see a remedy to the situation. They don't know if the, how God's going to work in that situation. And since they're not seeing any changes they, in that dis despair, they begin to, to question. And, the, and they, they, there's a time of bewilderment where they don't have answers to it. And so it's a time of weakness. And if a person asks the question out of that sincerity, does God really care? The, the answer for them is Romans chapter 8 in 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 verse 26, where it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth, knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. There are times you just don't know how to pray as you ought. And, and does God care? Yeah, look at that. He's, he's supplied for you the Holy Spirit who makes intercession for you with groanings that cannot be uttered, praying the will of God for you in that behalf, even when you don't know how to pray as you ought. Now, so, so that when you ask that question out of faith or, you know, in, in faith, um, then, then God does care. There's an answer for you. But there are those who ask that, and when I say immaturity, I'm talking about someone in unbelief. Someone who asks the question, does God really care? And, and, they're, and, they're, and they're doing it out of sarcasm. They're saying it in the flesh. And they do it because they're frustrated that God is not doing what he asked them to do, what he wants them to do, what they expect him to do. And so they say, well, well does God really care? And there's an answer for them as well. It's Romans chapter 9 and verse 20. Nay, O man, who art thou to reply against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hath thou made me thus? That for someone to expect God to do their will and, and then demand that, and if they don't see it, to declare God doesn't care, that they are really doing exactly what Israel is not accepting as Paul's teaching them in Romans 9, 10, and 11. In Romans 9, 10, 11, it's all about the mercy of God. And God will have mercy upon whom will have mercy. And Israel thinks they're the only ones that God should have mercy on. And what Paul is teaching them by the time you get to Romans chapter 11 is God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And, and, and God can do what he wants to do and he will do exactly what he said he will do. And so people who want God to do what they want, they need to find out what God, was, God is doing. And, and God ha is doing something. There is a... Everyone, everyone needs to understand God, <laughs> you understand who God is, before they start asking and thinking God going to do stuff for them, fill, fulfill their expectation. They need to understand that God is doing something in the creation that he made, heaven and earth. And in that creation God made, you need to have the big picture. Uh, come with me to Daniel chapter 4. God has a purpose in his creation. 
He has a purpose in the earth that he created, and you've already learned how that's going to center in the nation of Israel. And he has a purpose for the heavens, and you'll see that that is the purpose for us, members of the body of Christ, those who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior in this dispensation of grace in which we live. And if you don't understand those terms, you will as we go on. It, it says in Daniel chapter 4 concerning a kingdom being established on this earth, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, thought he controlled everything, found out he doesn't. So in verse 34, it says, at the end of the days, he went through an experience. Nebuchadnezzar lifted up, uh, uh, I lifted up mine eyes to, unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him that, that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, Why dost thou? Nebuchadnezzar learned that he might be king of Babylon who conquered the nation of Israel, but that's only because God put it under his hand. That God does in this earth according to his will. And God is accomplishing something, and there's a chastening of the nation of Israel. There'll be a restoration of Israel. It'll happen again in the tribulation, but ultimately the kingdom will be established through the nation of Israel here on earth. And Nebuchadnezzar got the big picture here. God is in charge, and God is doing something, and God has a purpose for the earth. And he's seeing that him, himself, the purpose for the earth. Now, for you and I in the age of grace, look over with me to First Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1. After Mar Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where God was dealing with the nation of Israel, choosing out 12 apostles, you get into the book of Acts, and God poured out the Holy Spirit, was bringing in the last days upon the nation of Israel. They continued to reject. And rather than wrath falling on this earth, like the prophet said would come, God raised up Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. Saul of Tarsus was trying to stamp out the name of Jesus. And... The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory shined on him. And by, the great, by God's grace, he made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles with a message of grace to us Gentiles. Paul tells Timothy here, don't get burned out, Timothy, and, and don't let fear control you. He says then in verse 8, be, thou therefore, uh, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the affliction of the gospel. According to, uh, according to the power of God, who called us and sa uh, uh, who, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, uh, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, we don't have time to keep reading here. I just want you to see that, that what was revealed to Paul is God's purpose in grace. And God has a purpose for us. And it's, it's, for us to know, to be praying, we need to be praying according to God's will. So we need to understand what God's will and purpose for us is. Come over to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, he starts out in verse 3 saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So you immediately realize that God's got a different purpose for us. It involves the heavenly places. But as you read, verse 5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. God's accomplishing his will. Um, it, it goes on in verse 9, says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Look down at verse 11. It says, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his will. So we're involved in his will. Now with that, Paul prays in verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and, uh, and the love to all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, and make mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, give unto you the spirit, Give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling. 
and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to, uh, to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, there, there's some things that Paul wants you to understand. And when he prays that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, you know how God's going to answer that prayer? He gave you the book of Ephesians. And it's going to give you that, what Paul's praying here is now going to give you that information that you're to receive. And, and you're to understand that you're part of what God is accomplishing and that ultimately that last one, the exceeding greatness of his power, has to do with the exaltation of Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. So that when you pray, your prayers ought to be in line with what God's purpose for you in grace is and your, God's calling for you and, and how God's dealing with us in grace. And, 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 uh, and, and that, that will change the way you pray and the things, what you pray about. Now, let me just say, too, is when you ask the question, does God care? Well, if you understand what's taking place here, in Romans chapter 11, it explains that if the fall of Israel and the diminishing of them is the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? That if the casting away of Israel be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? The, the Apostle Paul teaches us that what we're living in in the dispensation of grace, that God has stopped his dealings with Israel and turned to us in his grace to make us part of his calling in his grace. When you ask the question, does God care? God has changed the program what was, that he was fulfilling with Israel, postponed that, I didn't change it, postponed that program and has invited you to be a part of his eternal purpose. Amen. Does God care? What, what a privilege that is. But it's been quoted several times so far. Does God care? Romans 8, 32. It, it, if God be for us, well, wait a minute. I'm going to quote the wrong, that's the wrong verse, I think. Anyhow, the, it goes, I'm going to get it right. It don't hurt you to turn there. Romans 8. <laughs> it does start with, third. Okay. Verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God didn't spare his son, but delivered him up for you, delivered him up to the cross, delivered him up, uh, chapter 5 tells us there that, that when we were, it says in verse 6, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You didn't have the strength to save yourself. You can't save yourself from sin. You're the sinner. You're the ungodly person that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he died for you. God didn't spare him. He put your sins on Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ paid for every last sin you've ever committed so that by you trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, God freely give you all things. He's making you a part of his eternal purpose. It's a gift from God. Does God care? What a, what a privilege that is. In that, in that privilege, Romans, if you're in Romans 5, it says in verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. We have access to God because our sins have been taken care of and we have that continual, instant communication with God the Father. The privilege of always talking to God in prayer. You don't have to wait as they did. They went to the temple on the third hour to pray. There's none of that. We have the privilege of praying at all times. We have instant access to God the Father because of the relationship we have with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you're, you're there. Well, go back to Ephesians. I don't know where you are. <laughs> go back to Ephesians. Look, look at chapter 2. Just the, uh, the understanding of prayer here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So through the Lord Jesus Christ, through him, 
we both, that would be Jew and Gentile in this age of grace, who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have access by one spirit unto the Father. The privilege of being the, the God of the universe, the creator, the one who has an eternal purpose to exalt his son in heaven and earth, who has invited you to be a part of that, who has saved you by his grace. And I hope that if anybody here hasn't trusted Jesus Christ as their savior, you realize that if you're without strength, you need a savior. And Jesus Christ is your savior and a, a totally sufficient savior. So there is nothing left for you to do. There's nothing you can do to save yourself except trust the salvation that's through Jesus Christ. And then when you do, you have that access to God and, and you become part of that eternal purpose. In that access to God and in that salvation, God has given to you, it says in Ephesians 1.13 there, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were given the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is given to you, it's, it, it's called the spirit of adoption. Um, it, it's called that in Romans chapter 8, and it's called that again in, in, in Galatians chapter 4. And in Galatians chapter 4, when it talks about us receiving the spirit of adoption, it's talking about there, it starts out how when God was dealing with Israel under the law, he's dealing externally with them with, through these commandments, and, and they weren't able to keep it. And, and, but he's dealing with them as if they were children. But when God saved you by his grace and put his Holy Spirit in you and has given us the completed word of God, God is de dealing with mankind totally different. He's dealing with us as mature adult sons. First of all, understand the privilege that you have living in the age you're living in. This is the first age that ever had a complete Bible. I mean, the Jews of the Old Testament had a complete Old Testament but then there still needed to be a New Testament revelation to them. And then among that New Testament revelation to them is the revelation of the mystery given to the Apostle Paul for us. And when that was given, Paul talked about when that, we have that complete word of God, that we'd be no more children. That, we, that, that, that word, that unity of faith that would be given to us, would be given to us, making us unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We would have the mind of God. We would know the things of God. There's no more secret. It's all revealed. And when we study the Bible, we know what God is doing, so we know his will. We know what he's accomplishing. And that, can make, that takes you from a child to a mature man. But he didn't just give you the Bible. He gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in us to empower us. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prayed in Ephesians 1 that we might know these things. You get over to Ephesians chapter 3, and it says in verse 16, he says, well, verse 15 says, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant unto you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints. And I'm going to skip down to verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. You know, some people want to take the prayer promise that I explained to you that was given to the 12 apostles who were going to act in, in the authority of Jesus Christ on this earth in his absence, that whatever they ask, they'll receive. God's not doing that. God's not giving you everything you ask that you're going to receive today. He's doing this. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think according to the power that works in us. That power that works in us, that's back up in verse 16, that he would grant unto you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. God today is dealing with you as a growing up son of God. Now that's going to affect the way you pray. You know, I have the privilege. My dad will be turning 91 this year. I've had a lot of years to deal, to talk to my dad as a mature, grown-up son. You know, as a mature, grown-up son, when I have communion with my father, and I'm talking about my earthly father here, and we talk about things, whether it be politics or whether it be talking about raising kids or all the different frustrations that come up in life, and I talk to him. You know, when I talk to him about it, I'm not expecting him to do a bunch of stuff for me. I'm just talking to him about it. I do look for his wisdom. And my heavenly father, I have his wisdom given to me. 
and that wisdom as I'm talking and that wisdom becomes obvious, then I realize my responsibility, what I'm supposed to do. Isn't it pathetic? You know, you can, there's some families that would always tell you how to raise your kids. And there's a family that would tell other family, well, your son's an adult son, and if he was my son, here's what I would do. Then all of a sudden, their son gets in some trouble. And here they are out shelling out money, bailing them out, doing all these things. All the things he told the other people, I wouldn't do that to an adult son. <laughs> but, you know, that, in that regard, if I have financial problems and I'm talking to my dad about it, I don't expect him to get his wallet out and start trying to bail out and pay all my bills for me. I just need him to remind me to live within my budget. <laughs> but that's what I'm talking about, what prayer life is with God is communing with God, taking his word and realizing what his word said and my responsibility in all those details of life. Now come over with me to Philippians chapter 1. Paul first prays about that maturity. In, in verse 9, he says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So he's talking about you maturing and bearing some fruit. And that fruit is by Jesus Christ. Look over in chapter 2. We're to work out our salvation. That's the salvation that's in us is to be, come out in our life. And, and the way that it happens is verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When God was dealing with Israel, he was dealing with the world. And he was dealing with the thing, events around them. He was dealing on them. That's why the physical healing was there. But God in his grace today is working in the believer to will and to do of his good pleasure. And come over now to Philippians chapter 4. Every situation you face in life, every difficulty that comes, every tragedy, every event that takes place, you, you, there's going to be times that you're going to face difficult times. But look what verse 4 says of Philippians 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now, I did say rejoice in the circumstance, <laughs> rejoice in, in the tragedy, but you can always rejoice in the Lord. And, and then, but sometimes the anxiety gets, gets a hold of you. So verse 6 says, does that go off by itself? It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In that paper I gave you, I said, pray about everything and anything. I, know, I don't know that every preacher would tell you to do that. I, would, I tell you to do that. I read this verse and it's telling me to do that. You pray about everything. You pray, you pray concerning everything. Be, be, be careful for nothing, but in everything, in all those situations, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Prayer is asking, supplication is you keep praying until you're through that situation. And with thanksgiving, you don't just pray and ask and complain. You acknowledge some things. The goodness of God, what God has provided for you, and, and what you learn even in this chapter is that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And prior to that verse, Paul said, I have learned how to be a base and how to bound, how to be hungry, how to suffer need. And when it says over there in, that, in verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need. You know what your need is? That in every circumstance of life, to go through that situation empowered by God to the glory of God. To manifest, as I put in that paper, the manifest Christ in that situation. And God's given you the ability to do that. You need to acknowledge that when you pray. And when you do, it says, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding. You know, the peace that passes all understanding is when the situation don't change, but you can have peace in the situation. 
that's amazing. That, and that, that's prayer allows that to happen. As you pray about it, you're, getting, you're strengthening that inner man in that situation. You're, you're being instructed by the scriptures how to handle that situation and that God's supply is there. And the peace that passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds uh, through Christ Jesus. Prayer is powerful. It's not only a privilege, it's, it's a powerful privilege that we have in all the situations. Now, that's part one of the message. <laughs> If he didn't stop that clock, I would have thought I had another half hour to go. But, uh, yeah, and I don't have a watch, so I'm going to go by the clock. But there are things in prayer. And one of the things that I put in that paper, so I'm glad I passed out the paper, although I don't have the time to talk about, the part of the frustration in prayer is sometimes, well, I don't know how everyone else thinks. The question is, do we always know how God works in response to prayer? Because everything we talked about was about God working in us but there are things that happen in life and you pray intercession is praying for someone else sometimes you can be a part of their help and comfort but sometimes you can't and how would me praying for them how does that happen how is it that Paul would tell us to pray for kings for all that are in authority how does that happen what I'm I don't have the time to go through the verses. <laughs> but what I, I would tell you is I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I take, take away no idea. I have some idea on some of the cases. But the point is you don't have to know those things. You're, you're praying about those things. Paul asked the Romans to pray for him that he be delivered from reasonable men. Well, God's not going to work in those unreasonable men. How, how's that going to happen? And yet, when Paul finally went, he, and by the way, he prays it again in Colossians, so now you're getting to the mature time. And when Paul finally went and was brought to the Roman courts, he was praying, as in Colossians and Ephesians, that he would have boldness to speak as he ought to speak. He said, so he pray for me that I'll open my mouth and speak, but he also for the opportunity to speak, and it happened. How did it happen? I have no idea. But I, I'm convinced of this, as Paul didn't have any idea. Paul knew to pray what God's will was. And whatever outcome comes, Thessalonians tells us, pray without ceasing, in, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. You pray toward God's outcome. You don't have to figure out how it happens. And, and, and there's some cases where we wouldn't know how it happens. We could have some idea. But the idea is to pray for it, and you be faithful in your part, toward that outcome, and whatever part you can be, let God use you, pray for his outcome, and then, and then leave all the rest in, in the hands of God. But prayer is part of the process of God working in you, but also God working in the world, that we're joined together by the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we don't intrude in things that we don't know. So the warning I want to leave you is, even though I didn't get to talk about some of the circumstantial things, uh, is this. Speak where the Bible speaks. Be silent where the Bible's silent. There are things that we we thankful for everything. But how it happened and to say God did this, God did that, you're speaking outside the scriptures. Be silent where the, the Bible's silent, but in all things give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we barely could touch on things. It's important for us to understand how you're working and, and realize there is a difference in the age of grace than certainly Israel's program, and that ought to affect what we pray about and how we pray, where you're working in us and what you're doing with us and what the outcome, your desired outcome would be, that we can pray toward those ends. But, Father, we do thank you that you are uh, the God of the world, the creator of heaven and earth, that we know that, that all things work together in the scheme of things, that it is all going to come out the way you want it to come out. All things work together for good to them who love God and to those that are called according to your purpose. So I pray that each person here realizes your grace and salvation and has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
And then, Father, would realize what an opportunity to read your Bible, to grow and call you their Heavenly Father and call on you often and continually, instant in prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.